Hi. So, as Rachel said, um, yeah, I'm a must. Well, former master student, I guess. It's quite strange because I finished. You finished doing a master's project or any kind of like PhD or whatever, and then you're an in-between period where <laughs> you're just, what am I right now? Um, and yes, I'm going to talk about more the more theoretical and more generalized aspect of my project. My master's project was basically using dropouts for model uncertainty extraction on binary classification. And the data set was an astronomical data set. And that was basically the connection with astronomy. But the focus was on how to get well calibrated uncertainties when using neural networks. Um, and in this talk, I'm first going to go over what is dropout? Um, why should we care about uncertainties? Because why? <laughs> um, dropout for Bayesian model approximation, which is how can we use this technique for that? And how do you implement it? once you know what it is and it can if it can be used so let's go over it what is dropout now when i wrote this presentation i assumed that most people knew what a neural network was um and i would like to follow with that assumption but if no if someone doesn't could you please say now so that I can give a brief update. OK, great, cool. <laughs> so a neural network is basically an AI or like, well, the ones that I work with are like feed forward networks, neural networks, multi-layer perceptrons, which my supervisor tends to call them because she thinks the name is cooler and she's she's right, really. Um, and they practically what they are is a set of multiple arrays with different values. And when you have a data set where a variable, you've got a variable and the variable is described by a multitude of features. And these features, for example, you've got, I don't know, a mug and the mug is blue and it weighs 300 grams and it's full or empty or something and the color the fullness or emptiness or whatever and the weight are all its features and the mug itself is the object the sample on the other hand you could have i don't know uh, i'm trying to figure out well like a glass and the glass is transparent so you could say it has no color basically um it's full and it weighs i don't know 200 grams or whatever that's probably completely wrong but it doesn't matter really so both of these are sampled in a data set what a neural network does is it takes each of these features so the weight the color and the fullness and so the fir our first layer is an array with three neurons so three unit, each unit containing one of the features. Uh, well, actually, that's wrong. Each unit containing all of the features. And each feature is multiplied by a weight. And these weights are basically at random. And they're sum, and the sum is passed on to the next layer, which is a hidden layer. In the hidden layer, the processes are basically continued. And the hidden layers are arrays with a random amount of units, so a random amount of spaces in the array. Um, and the same process with the multiplication of the weights and the summing is continued. But um, you don't, you basically don't have like only three as you have for the input layer where, I okay, I was wrong, I'll start again with that. The input layer, has three units and each unit has one of the features. Then all of the values from the input layer, so all three values go to each one of the layers in the first, which one, each one of the neurons in the first layer. And I'm gonna use this scheme because I don't know why I didn't use it first. And so you can see that basically the first, the bottom layer on the A, on the image on the left on A has your input layer. So each one of them is a feature. 
and the value from each feature goes to each one of the neurons in the first hidden layer, which is the middle layer. And so each neuron on the hidden layer takes all of the values from the previous layer, multiplies each of those values with a different weight, sums them up and passes them on. In between the hidden layers, you've got a function called an activation function, which is basically usually a function with a threshold. Um, one of the most popular one is called the rectified linear unit function, which says that if a value is below zero, then it should be taken as zero. So it's gonna be replaced with zero. Otherwise it should be just the value, which, and what that activation function does is basically filters out, if you would, which values get passed on. So each of them have to like fit a certain condition for them to be passed on. So if we want our model to figure out whether an object is a mug or a glass, it'll have to, you know, like how much water is in there or how full it is or how, how much it weighs or what the, what's the color, stuff like that. And your final layer, you can have basically as many units in the hidden layers and as many layers, you, hidden layers you want. Um, usually there's better architectures, so it depends um, for your data set. You usually just try basically and you get it. Usually the, the low, like as small as you can make it and it performs well, the better it is because you want to have small models because they train faster. Um, and your final layer is your output layer. So it's the layer that's going to give you out the um, your prediction, basically. And that layer, you can have one or two units or multiple units, depending how many classes you've got. So if you've got mug or not mug, then it's two classes, or it could be just one class, and it's like mug and it's gonna be one if it's a mug, for example, the value could be one if it's a mug or zero. So like a Boolean value would be returned or it could be two and it could be a softmax function applied to that, like a softmax activation function. And it would basically make the two values, the two raw predictions, which would be just random numbers. It would pass them through a softmax and it would be like a probability and it could, again, it would go between zero and one, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, basically the model, like a neural network is a collection of random arrays that perform all of this multiplication and summations in order to learn and to, um, to get out a prediction about your data set. The way they learn is by comparing their output to the to a well to a date to a label that you've got on your data set so when you're training it you have a label data set so you know the true answer and you compare your your prediction to your true answer and you try to minimize the difference in between those two there's various ways you can do that there's various ways you can calculate the difference between two, those two. There is, they're called loss functions and there's a billion choices for them. <laughs> Usually the most popular are cross entropy, um, which, yeah. <laughs> or the uh, mean squared loss function. Um, so yeah, and you've got an optimizer, which basically just like updates the weights you apply on each of the features and stuff so that the answer gets as close as possible to the true answer. So where does dropout come into all of this? Dropout is a technique that initially was developed as a regularization technique. Um, and the way that it works is it cuts out neurons and their connections between hidden layers and sometimes even input layer, like the input layer, hidden layers, and so on. Um, it's really interesting because it minimizes co-adaptation and it feels a bit counterintuitive that 
oh, I've, I'm putting as many neurons as I want in the hidden layer, and then I'm taking half of them out. Well, half is the maximum, but as you get bigger and bigger models, so the more, the more hidden layers you've got and the more neurons you have, it tends to converge to 0.5. Now there's some paper that explains why that's happening, but that's probably beyond <laughs> the purpose of this talk. <laughs> and I'm gonna keep with that. It's, that's what it does. If you don't trust me, you can look it up. Um, but yeah, so basically what happens is you've got this thing called a dropout rate which is the total number of units per layer that are gonna be dropped or disconnected. And each unit is gonna have a probability P of being dropped. Now, I just realized it's got a typo in because the probability is not really zero and one. It's, that's more the sample that's being drawn from the distribution, but it could be considered a, as a probability of zeros and one. Um, and what you do basically with the dropout rate is you go to a Bernoulli distribution, which is a distribution of zeros and ones, a discrete distribution, that's the word, God, I can't believe I forgot that. Um, and you sample those, you sample zeros and ones, and you make another array with that, and you multiply your input layer, your hidden layer with those. And at the same positions that you've got neurons, there's going to be ones or zeros. So when you multiply those, some neurons values are gonna be passed on and some are gonna be nulled. And the effect is basically that you're cutting down the neuron and its connection because the whole value, the whole of the work that neuron has done is just nulled out by multiplication with zero. And that just has the effect of creating a thinned out network. So it's a smaller network than the original network. Now at each training step, because the way you do it is you train these models in a loop. And at each training step, you cut different neurons out. This has a really good effect on it because it stops co-adaptation. So basically it stops your model from relying too much on a certain unit. And, and just basically build, like having, I don't know, preferred kids basically. <laughs> um, and it's really good. And it's, it's been shown to work really well for regularization. And it's, it makes models train faster. Um, and it's really inexpensive to just implement. Now, the dropout rate is a hyperparameter. And the problem with hyperparameters is you need to tune them by hand. So you need to find the best number of total neurons to cut out from a layer by hand, which is usually done with a grid search. So you try a bunch of them and then you just compare the results and that's gonna take ages from experience. <laughs> and the best way to do it would obviously be if you could just make the model learn that as well. And thank goodness there was someone who already did that. And in a paper in 2017, Galatao proposed that sampling the dropout, so the, well, sampling the probabilities of the neurons to be dropped from a continuous distribution makes the dropout rate optimizable. And that is true, that's, it works. And the way that it does that is they sample it from a concrete distribution, which is just a relaxation of the Bernoulli distribution. So the concrete distribution is a continuous distribution between zero and one, where most of the weight is on zero and one. And it's the, I can't see my point, unfortunately. Oops. But it's basically the, left-hand side bit of the figure, the vertical bit. And as you can see, it goes from, from zero to one. Well, it's not labeled, but it goes from zero to one. And most of the weight is on zero and one with some weight in between, which is why I said that 
the neurons have a probability of being dropped because now instead of having an array with zeros and ones, you've got an array with values between zero and one. Most of them are gonna be zeros and ones, but you're gonna get some which are in between that. And that has the effect of just this distribution is being continuous, means that it's, um, it has a derivative at all points, which means that you can then use optimizers with it, um, which means that it's a learnable parameter. And it's great because that means your model can learn this too, so you don't have to worry. It means that your model can find the ideal bit, the ideal value for these rates, and it will just perform as well as possible because it's calculated it to be as, as good as possible. Um, so now we found out what dropout is, uh, we found out what models are. Why would we care about their uncertainty? So these things can make predictions for us um, because we can already make the dropout to be basically, to make our predictions as good as possible. Why would we care about uncertainties? Well, uncertainties are really good for context, basically. And when you, they can be life saving basically because knowing what you don't know is really important. Knowing what you don't know in medical software, in car software, like computers for poor cars and like plane softwares and other stuff, basically that's just like small bit, but it's really important to know what your software in general don't, doesn't know. And it's the same with AIs, um, there's important implementations of AI that it's really important to, it, it gives context as to why, yeah, of course, knowing your uncertainties on pulsar predictions, for example, and what I've done is really interesting. It's really cool. It's for astronomy. It's not going to be life-threatening, but it is really good anyway, because science requires it for integrity. In general, everyone wants uncertainties. But there was a few years ago, for example, um, the Met Police implemented um, facial recognition on the streets of London. And because it had good precision and good accuracy, they just picked whatever the soft, like whoever the software flagged, they picked off the street for a full body search. And that's not okay if you don't have uncertainties and you don't have the context as to how your model predicted that because you know, in quite a few cases, they were very much mistaken and they were basically breaking the law. So when you know, why the model, where your model could go wrong, even if you don't know why, but you know, okay, this is what it could do wrong. Then you know how to rely on it, how much you can rely on it. And it's just, it's, it's just a game basically of the high precision, high accuracy and the high precision, low accuracy. All of these things are very important, but it's very important to also have to also know how these things are surrounded by your uncertainties. Because it's not just, right, my model has very high accuracy and high precision, but maybe there is something that just because it performed very well on a test set or something doesn't mean that it knows everything. And for, for example, it might have a high aleatoric uncertainty um, and the aleatoric uncertainty is something that no matter how much data you fit into it, you can't reduce. And it's something that with concrete dropout, your model can predict. So it can predict the aleatoric uncertainty on the data. Um, if you know your predictions on that, then you know what your model can't extract or what it knows it can't extract from the data so you know where you can't rely on it and that's just one example basically and just in general in in technology it's really good to have even where it isn't like oh life-saving or whatever it's it's important because again you give context to to whatever you're doing it's just a very good thing so how can you use dropout to do that or how can you 
get uncertainties in general, even if you don't use dropout. Well, normally there's Bayesian neural networks, BNNs, which are a fantastic, fantastic way of getting uncertainties on their predictions because they use Bayes theorem to predict their uncertainties because they, instead of have like everything for them, their weight, their everything is a probability. And they're great for that, but they are super high in terms of computational costs, because while normally all the weights and everything in a model are one single value that you just update randomly, in Bayesian models, you've got an, a like a range of values because this is a probability and all of it needs to be updated and it's they're just very high to hard to implement most of the time um, however um, Galen Gahramani um, showed in 2016 that you could use dropout basically to approximate very well a BNN which is great because again dropout can just <laughs> cut out so much time from training like it's incredible. And, and that's because random units are disconnected at each iteration and it introduces non-linearities. So it just gives you a bunch of models that are smaller and all of the connections are random. And you basically have an average at the end. The, the end result of the trained model at the end is an, is an average of all of these random connected models. And all of the random connected units, and that is quite accurate as an approximation to a Bayesian model. Now, I didn't include the full maths because no one wants maths. <laughs> uh, this is a chill talk. But um, if anyone has the guts for maths, there's, that's a great paper, um, quite thick to go through. <laughs> I. I'm not going to suggest my own thesis, but I mean, you could have that too. <laughs> um, once it's been done for corrections, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> um, so yeah, now that we've figured out that the that we can use dropout for Bayesian model approximation, we'll try and see how we can implement dropout to get the uncertainty extraction out. And yeah, so. Basically, if we've got this model, which is a set of rays with n input values, m values for each hidden layer, and c values for each class, we just apply the dropout for each of them, and we multiply with the array. Um, that's the dropout array, and that's all good and great. Um, this is an example of such a function. Now, this example is for a classic dropout. Um, and this classic dropout means that it, it samples from the Bernoulli distribution. So it doesn't sample uh, probabilities, it just samples zeros and ones. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's just an example, basically. Um, I do have full code. Um, it's not very nicely done, but it probably will be quite soon on my GitHub. Um, but even I think even the paper, the original 2016 paper has some Keras code um, on it. But basically all you do is when you're creating your model, you're also creating layers for dropout and you just put the um, layer for dropout after your layers, like your normal hidden layers. And it just performs it by itself pretty much. It, it just goes on without you having to do too much. Um, for concrete dropout, it's a bit more complicated because um, a concrete dropout model looks a bit like that. Now that's actually a scheme of my final model from my research. Um, and the way that it works is the blue layer is the input layer. The two orange layers are the hidden layers or yellow layers, I don't exactly know. Honestly, my screen is very bad at colors. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and the pink and purple neurons 
um, are the output layers. There are, there's actually two output layers. And one of the layers outputs the mean predictions for the two classes. So it, it's one urine for a class and one urine for the other class because the way that I had my data set was, I was looking at a data set and the data set was um, a big sample or a, a big batch of um, pulsars, which is a type of star and random interference from satellites and random objects from the noise and whatever. Um, and the way that I did the classification was, I care if it's either a pulsar or it's not a pulsar. So I only have two layers for that mean layer, but two neurons for that mean layer, but you could have as many as you have classes basically, or yeah, how many classes you want. And it outputs that, and it also outputs the base and logarithm of the variance the model predicts for each sample. And that variance is actually the aleatory uncertainty it predicts for each sample. And the reason why we predict the log 10, uh, the, yeah, the base 10 log of the variance is because it's more numerically stable than the actual variance. Now, honestly, no one could go too much into detail as to why it's more numerically stable, but I, well, actually, I think it's because it can't actually go below zero and that makes sense. Um, no one really explained it, but I just assumed this up. <laughs> so yeah, and so what's great about this is by implementing concrete dropout and by using this version of a model, you can already get your aleatoric uncertainty like that. It's super easy and it doesn't, it, it doesn't take much basically. It's just a normal multi-layer perceptron. It's not, it's not too fancy. It's nothing too much about it. And you can already extract that uncertainty and it's great. And in order to extract different types of uncertainty of it, so on the whole prediction, on the whole final prediction, the total uncertainty, there's uh, <laughs> two ways you can extract the total uncertainty. And, and that is during testing, you go through a loop. And that loop is you go and pass a sample a number of times through the model. And each time you save a, um, the, the mean and like the outputs, basically. And if you calculate the variance of the means over those I don't know, 10 times, for example, that you've passed a sample. And then the mean of those variances <laughs> of the mean, which is very tongue twistery, then you get one measure of the uncertainty on the final prediction of the model. Because basically what you're doing is you're calculating a variance on the final, on the final model prediction. Um, now you can either calculate the meaning between the classes or you can just keep the variance for each class. In my project, I kept the variance for each class. Um, I said the mean of the variance here. Now I'm not entirely sure that would actually work too well having said that. So I might say that maybe <laughs> having put that in the presentation wasn't, I'll, I'll keep, say with a grain of salt, probably shouldn't do the meaning between the classes, but you will have a variance for each of the classes. So one measure of the uncertainty, of the total uncertainty. Now that will also contain your aleatoric uncertainty values in it. And you could extract the aleatoric uncertainty values from it, and you could get the epistemic uncertainty values from it. Um, the epistemic uncertainty is due to the uncertainty that your model predicts and it's because of, um, and it's, yeah, it's the uncertainty resulting from the limited amount of data that you've got. Basically, because we don't have infinite data, we don't know everything that we could about this particular data set or particular distribution. Another way that you could calculate um, the uncertainty on the, the total uncertainty on the final, um predictions but you couldn't extract 
the aleatory consistency out of this one. This is just another different measure and it's not going to be equal to everything else. It's just a different measure. And I, it took me so much to like twist my head around this one while writing my thesis because I was like, well, why aren't they the same? They should be the same. Is by taking the entropy of the softmax of the mean layer. So if you apply the softmax function to the output of the mean layer, so the two neurons or however neurons on the output layer, and you take the entropy and you sum basically that just you just take the, the classic channel entropy of that. Um, that is also a measure of the of the total and final uncertainty on your classification process. Um, and yeah, it's just quite easy. Um, all of this code implementation is quite quite easy to do basically and it works and it's good uh, this model performed very well on a data set outperforming several models in the literature and even where it didn't out outperform it still had the ace in the sleeve if, I, if you can say that where it could just be like well it didn't go better but i have uncertainties on it at least so you know i know what i don't know do these other people know what they don't know? I don't think so. So yeah, in this talk, uh, we talked about what is dropout, which is a regularization technique that disconnects units from a neural network, or well, it started as a regularization technique, and but it also ended up being uh, very good at uncertainty extraction. Um, why do we care about these uncertainties? Well, because they do give research integrity and context to your model performance. Um, we also found out how dropout can be used for Bayesian model approximation and how you can implement it for uncertainty extraction. And yeah, thank you for listening. And I'm open for collaboration on my email and on my LinkedIn.